My name is Moin Yassin. I'm speaking on behalf of Global Vision 2000, uh, independent UK Islamic think tank. Um, I'm, I'm in Ro- uh, England and Rochester just now. Now, one of the things that fascinates me, Moeen, and I'm not sure I'm not the only person to be fascinated by it, is this kind of uh, what they call kind of fake Islam. We've seen it with the a coup attempt in July in Turkey, accusations against something called the Gulen movement in the United States. Can you tell us a bit about that? Who is Gulen and what is the Gulen movement? In modern, the contemporary Islamic world and indeed Turkey, there are many uh, uh, Islamic movements, not just sects, you know, theological schools of thought, but movements which are populist, popular, and which have a very broad agenda, not just religious, could be humanitarian, uh, could be social, could be political, and even economic. But tell so us about this, Gulen, what about this Gulen movement specifically? Who is Gulen and what, what do they believe? Well, well, the Gulen movement, as far as I know, is a Turkish Orthodox Islamic revivalist movement. Um, uh, they may have uh, a focus on uh, humanitarian, religious... Um, uh, agendas. Um, no, no doubt, I'm sure they have uh, a political agenda too. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, people in Turkey, more than anywhere else pretty much, have been pointing the finger at this Gulen movement as being uh, behind the uh, coup attempt back in July, which was an abortive attempt. It didn't succeed. And it seems to have swung a lot of opinion of the uh, rich and powerful in Turkey against the United States because Gulen is where... Uh, or that's where this Gulen chap is. So, do, what, what do you know about um, what they may, what their influence might have been, and involvement in that coup? Well, I mean, uh, they are popular. They have a huge uh, education uh, empire, if you want to call it that, uh, both in Turkey and in Turkic-speaking countries or Turkic uh, kinship countries. Um, I mean. Uh, what, what can one say, I mean, in this day and age, in the age of deceit? I mean, uh, they're a good scapegoat, obviously, um, for various people to kick about. What do they teach? What kind of things are they... Uh, I mean, if they've got all these schools, it's interesting to know what is their agenda. Well, well there, as I said, in contemporary... Well, Turkey, if we just focus on Turkey, has gone through a massive U-turn since Ataturk who made it lean towards the West, uh, you know, um, ideologically, um, socially, and uh, the Gulen movement, and indeed the AKP, you know, the Justice Party, are both manifestations of Turkey's revivalism to conservative Islam. Indeed, both of them are allies. There was a fallout, I understand, maybe bad blood, but to accuse the Gulenists of uh, the coup d'etat, I don't think it does justice. Maybe they were used by uh, another power, uh, in in this case, the Pax Americana, uh, perhaps to destabilise. That's another issue. Um, So, yeah, they they may have been uh, manipulated by other forces. OK, look, let's move on to Britain because we have another a, a sort of... I mean, they're not the same, but they're a similar sort of uh, alternative Islamic think tank organisation that does a lot of education work called Amedia, A-H-M-E-D-I-A. What, what do you know about them? Yes. Well, quite a lot. I mean, in uh, contemporary Islam, uh, well, uh, well, I'll, I'll go back the last 200 years... Um, there have arisen various, as I said, revivalist movements. The Ahmadiyya movement specifically grew up in British India, the Raj. And indeed, after the so-called mutiny that we call here, or revolt. So after 1857, notice what I said, after, in North India, the power centre of India and Pakistan, actually, more or less, uh, Delhi, Islamabad area, in a town called Kadian, that's why they're called Kadianis, or Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, Um, they have also the name Mirzai Kadiani Ahmadiyya, a guy who rose up, a revivalist, uh, in the British uh, uh, post-revolt mutiny era, and he claimed to be a messiah, the promised messiah uh, of Islam, um, dare I say Christianity. Uh, So it's a mix, it's a, you know, uh, 
a confusion or, or, or convoluted interpretation of uh, Islam and Christianity, actually. Um, now, that's a long time ago. Uh, so what, what is it? I mean, well, do they have uh, a, a, a more modern um, so-called Messiah? Because, I mean, these are, everyone's a little bit, I think, quite rightly questions anyone that comes along and says that I'm the Messiah. I mean, and it yes. starts to sound like it might be a kind of cult. Well, well, yes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Prophet Muhammad salam said in, uh, as you know, we had a major conference or a specialist conference on eschatology, that in end times, Muslims will be divided into 73 groups. Now, this uh, end time scenario is also relevant to other faiths, I believe, to really understand, you know, authentic Christianity, authentic Judaism, authentic Islam is a huge challenge in an age of deceit. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line is the Ahmadi has obviously grown since the what, late uh, 70s onwards. In Pakistan, there's several million of them. They're a huge issue. They blame to be blasphemous. Why? Because, uh, not because they're, uh, they believe in a guy called uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, but because they're claiming to be Muslims. But according to the mainstream, all mainstream Muslim sects or th- theological schools of thought, they have attacked the basic tenet of Islam which is the creed of uh, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah I testify that Muhammad is the prophet of God by definition it means the last prophet by the way uh, of 124000 from Adam Abraham Moses Jesus Muhammad uh, so they've attacked that uh, fundamental belief and the second part of the creed is to testify that no nothing should be worshiped except God in, in total sovereignty so the first tenant of the faith has been attacked, and that's why uh, in Pakistan or, or India, indeed, um, or the Indian subcontinent, they, there is a movement to, um, what's the word, to emphasize the, the, the seal of prophethood, which they have, uh, in a sense, uh, attacked. Now, uh, the, 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 OK, that's, that's very interesting that they've got these two things which seem to go against Islam, the Ahmadiyya sect. But, um, I mean, there, there is also talk, uh, surely, of uh, someone called the Mahdi in Islam who is going to lead this great caliphate uh, of some kind anyway. And surely, uh, you know, Muhammad can't be the final prophet if you've got the Mahdi coming in the future in order to lead Islam into the Promised Land. No, the Mahdi means in Arabic, as an Arabist myself, I'm not Arabic, but I've studied Arabic, and a specialist. A Mahdi means the rightly guided one. He's a revivalist. A prophet is one who has had communication of some sort from divine source, uh, maybe a book, revelation. A, a, a revivalist is a common man. It could be you, it could be me, actually. Um, so uh, there's a huge difference between a person who has been chosen as a vehicle to communicate divine commands, the revelation to the people in a time-space context um, uh, compared to a Mahdi. So, but, but, but this comes back to the point that uh, in end times, I believe modern um, civilization, global civilization, cannot be looked in isolation from, from, from the fact that we're in an era of time which is quite unique, actually. And in this time, deceit is rampant. Well, I think you you mentioned yourself, didn't you, and I think you're quite right, that there are these many proliferation of fake versions of Islam, fake versions of Judaism, and fake versions of Christianity. Yes. Well, uh, the latest news today is fakery is everywhere. Donald Trump is talking about fake news. I mean, what is reality, actually? What is news? You know, we're coming to a fundamental issue in, in contemporary global village. What is news and what isn't? And this is very relevant, very relevant to the destiny of humankind. Well, it is, and particularly I, I, through the mainstream media. You know, you, we, you know, if one cannot rely on the mainstream press, then any kind of fake news that's being put out by the mainstream press has got yeah. to be brought into question. Anyway, look, what I want to get to the point here really is... How does this link up with groups like ISIS, which seem to be a bit on the wane now in Syria, but certainly uh, there is a a very definite ideological bent to them? I mean, does that fit in with the Quran at all? 
Well, <clears throat> they're not in the Quran, no. Quran doesn't mention ISIS, but certainly the black flag movements are mentioned in uh, several of the prophetic traditions, uh, which are considered to be authentic, that in end times there will be two groups who will raise the black flag. And as you know, in Afghanistan, <clears throat> the Taliban <clears throat> has got the black flag, and now you've got ISIS. ISIS, by the way, I believe, and I said it on television when it rose up, is a NATO <clears throat> Zionist uh, creation. Uh, sure, there are Muslims involved in it, uh, but uh, they've been funded, armed, trained by NATO, America, and its allies in the region. Now, look, have you got any evidence? Uh, no. Have you got any evidence for that, that ISIS is actually being funded or created by the uh, Zionists in Israel and NATO? Well, one, uh, I, I've not got chapter and verse, but uh, one uh, isn't naive to the schemes and plots of those who are enemies of Islam. The bottom line of uh, ISIS is it has demonized, has given a great, great practical evidence globally in a global village to everyone that Islam is a bloodthirsty, fanatical, this, that other religion and, and terrorist give it also the terrorist stamp. So, I mean, do you honestly believe that is being inspired by authentic, divine-based um, love and justice values? Well, and also, you, you know, you've pointed out as well that uh, that may be being supported by NATO and the Zionists. So, of course, they're not really terrorists because a, a terrorist is someone that doesn't have any official kind of state backing and support. They're a kind of autonomous guys that get hold of guns and try and do a revolution of some kind, whereas it seems that there certainly may be some support for ISIS amongst NATO and, and from Israel. <clears throat> oh, of course. I mean, you know, the, come on, you know the Yenin plan is to divide, uh, or, or what's the word, balkanize the region. Uh, so, I mean, uh, <coughs> ISIS, <coughs> uh, you know, the Sykes-Picot uh, agreement, this is the, what, 100th anniversary this year? I mean, divide and rule's nothing new. That model's collapsed. So they want to further balkanize the region, and this will uh, strengthen the hand of Israel and the axis of evil, Rome, London, uh, sorry, Tel Aviv, Rome, London, Washington. Now, Donald Trump has said that he supports the idea of moving the capital of Israel uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, what significance might that have in Islam or for, for Muslims? Well, huge issue, huge issue. I mean, uh, I mean, as you know, in our conference, we were going to raise this issue of Jerusalem, but we'll need another special conference on it. It's a very sensitive issue for many, many people. Uh, the bottom line is uh, we're in, in interesting times. The status of Jerusalem is in question. Uh, the Americans or Pax Americana to date hasn't dared of, of moving the Israeli capital to, to Jerusalem. This bloke and his gang of um, right-wing neocon uh, Zionist uh, lovers uh, are, are, are talking about that. This is a very dangerous move. And uh, in eschatological terms, Jerusalem has a, a critical, pivotal role in global peace and justice. We have to watch uh, this uh, uh, developments in this city and this area very, very carefully. Well, don't forget, of course, that the German, many people don't know this, but the, the, the Chinese government, of course, China is a major uh, nuclear weapons power. It's at the... Uh, Security Council of the United Nations alongside the United States and Russia uh, as one of the kingpins of the uh, global military um, system. And the Chinese have said that they want to see a Palestinian state with its capital in East Jerusalem. Um, could that happen, do you think, if, if um, Israel's capital moves to Jerusalem? Well, as you know, the problem with uh, Israel is it's had the backing... Well, it's a creation, an illegitimate... Uh, creation of uh, the so-called uh, New World Order or Old World Order, and uh, it's uh, had uh, carte blanche, you know, support by the superpower of the day. Uh, but obviously, uh, power politics changes from, for instance, a, a unipolar world just now to a multipolar, which we're going back to. So, yes, uh, Israel might be in for a surprise. And also from Islamic history, even during the, during the Crusades, which I've been looking at carefully again, and indeed even Al Jazeera have, uh, what's the word, they have uh, come up with documentaries looking at Arab perspectives on the Crusades. It's quite clear even during the Crusade periods the Muslims had Hudna, truces with the enemy.
during the Crusades, almost a thousand years ago, 900 years, well, it was a 200-year war, there were periods when the Muslims and the, the, the Crusaders, yeah, uh, engaged in truces. So in the contemporary uh, um, situation of Palestine, um, there's, there's uh, the opportunity um, uh, in diplomatic terms to have a peace treaty with the enemy. That is perfectly legitimate in Islamic law. Yeah, and your point is what? Well, it, uh, well, uh, some sort of peace treaty, yeah, could be um, formulated with the Zionist regime. I'm not advocating it, but I'm just saying even in Islamic history, uh, almost uh, in a similar situation, almost a thousand years ago, the Muslims engaged in peace treaties with the Crusaders who were occupying Jerusalem or, or parts of Palestine.
one of the things we're not getting today is historical analysis on the region. I can remember when uh, Radio 5 first started broadcasting its 24-hour ro- rolling news uh, back in 1990, I think it was, at the time of the first Gulf War. We yep. had loads of BBC correspondents on. Every sort of 10 minutes there'd be another one talking about uh, the first Gulf War, you know, the Iraq, the um, surrounding of Iraq, moving um, British and American troops over to Saudi Arabia, for example, for that war, um, where Saddam Hussein was uh, kicked out of Kuwait, but they didn't uh, kind of carry on into Iraq. At that time, there was an incredible wealth of historical analysis uh, from the BBC, uh, from all their different correspondents. Nowadays, we seem to be getting very little of it. So uh, I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit on the Sykes-Picot Agreement, because I know that that was signed in secret by the British and the French foreign secretaries at the time, 100 years ago, and it's one of the things which has led to the situation we have today. So can you just take us through Sykes-Picot and explain why we should be interested in in that agreement, the secret agreement, which only came out after the Russian Revolution, because the Russian revolutionaries well, all, revealed it to the world. It was a secret pact with the French and the British. Well, that's a very valid point. Well, several empires were destroyed by the First World War, so that raises questions who benefited and who actually instigated it. Uh, indeed, every problem in the Middle East or greater Middle East has uh, arisen since the collapse of the Ottoman uh, uh, state. And ironically, under the cover of NATO, Turkey is a part of NATO, it's a legacy of the Ottoman Empire, is beginning to have a re-establish its sphere of influence in that entire region, as history seems to be catching up with us. But basically, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, depends when you uh, take the, 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 the starting point or finishing point. Some people say it's from 1924, but that was the abolition of the Caliphate uh, and the establishment of the uh, Turkish secular Republican state. Um, anyway, uh, in 1917, when Turkey was losing the, the war because of treachery by its Arab Muslim Muslim uh, citizens, if you want to call it, because they were misled by the imperialists who were saying revolt against the Turks will give you independence, did they help? That's, that's why I mentioned the illegitimacy of uh, the Zionist state of Israel. The Arabs were, were Muslims were made to fight each other. The Arabs were promised by the British and French revolt against the Ottoman Empire, and we will deliver you an Arab homeland. What, especially for the Palestinians in particular, uh, which, which is really a part of the Sykes-Picot uh, bigger uh, picture or bigger plot. Um, uh, basically, uh, you know, they, they've, they, they've, they, they, the present they were given was a Nakba. The Nakba is the Arabic for ethnic, well, well, huge crisis, which is basically ethnic cleansing. That is their definition of an, well, it's a catastrophe. And a catastrophe, in one word, is an ongoing process of ethnic cleansing. And uh, I think under ISIS, um, the old Sykes-Picot agreement is crumbling. I think they're trying to re the region. So uh, what, what are your thoughts about the uh, progress of things in Syria? Because it looks as if there's now peace uh, agreements uh, being negotiated between the main parties, that is to say uh, the uh, uh, Kurds, the uh, Turks and the Syria, Syrian Arab army and the Russians. Well, well can, can, any make, can anyone make sense of what's going on there? <clears throat> Great tragedy. Uh, Syria, in Islamic eschatology, this whole region, um, which was partitioned by Sykes-Picot, you know, uh, what is called Israel, Jordan, Gaza, uh, West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, parts of it in Turkey, all this was called Sham. Sham, or Greater Syria, has a huge uh, uh, eschatological role which will be played, and it's being played out right now. Uh, right now, I mean, the whole thing's a mess. Will it last? No, I don't think it will last, because any 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 um, quid pro quo uh, which is based on sand, really building a castle on sand, will not last. You know, if it's if dictatorship uh, remains, if justice and the people's sovereignty and will isn't respected, uh, no, it, w- it will not last. I don't see it lasting. Now, you're talking about eschatology. This is really the, what the Quran is going to predict for the end of the world. Do you think it's really come to that? 
No, I didn't say eschatology means end of the world. It is the Arabic term is means uh, the, the 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 end times to use the English word, yeah. Or, or in English, uh, eschatology means study of eschaton, the end. Uh, so, end um, the the study of end times isn't doesn't mean the end, the last day. Indeed, that's a separate phenomenon in Islamic theology and indeed Judeo-Christian Islamic theology, the Day of Judgment. I'm not talking about the Day of Judgment. I'm talking about the phase of human history in uh, which we are moving towards the end. And it actually, it has a very optimist picture, actually, in Judeo-Christian Islamic theology where justice will, will reign, not just love. I remember at that conference... A minister talking about love, 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 love. I, I, well, I'm sorry. I'm not. People aren't just interested in love. They want justice. And uh, the only way in Islamic eschatology we believe justice in this mad, crazy, sad, bad world will happen is the intervention not of God directly, but of a divinely guided and blessed human leader who will be allied to the second coming of Isa, Jesus, who will be a follower of the Mahdi, so there will be a Christian-Muslim alliance by definition. Now, some people say that uh, they think the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus comes back, he'll be a Muslim. Is that true? No, I, 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 well, I, I, we've got clear a clear picture on what, 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 what has been described in Islamic eschatology. Jesus has all, there's a whole chapter on, on Mary, Surah Maryam, in the Quran you know, the virgin birth and all the rest of it, and uh, the Abrahamic, uh, you know, tradition uh, of which Jesus is highly respected, equivalent to Muhammad as a prophet of God. Um, virgin birth, miracles, uh, the, the the book that's come, you know, the Bible. I, I mean, uh, the, the bottom line is Muslims do not, Muslims believe he, he was betrayed. He was about to be crucified, but he was uh, saved. He's living. And he's coming down again uh, in the land of Sham, greater Syria, specifically Damascus. And him and the Mahdi will be allied. Whether he is a Muslim, yes. If, if you mean by Muslim, he's going to be a follower of, the, of God. Yes. In that sense, he will be a Muslim and he will be allied and a, a follower of the Mahdi. He will pray behind the Mahdi in the great mosque of Damascus. This is clearly mentioned. It's not a figment of my imagination. And there will be a clash. It's not as simple as that. There will be a clash between good and evil, militarily and theologically. Fascinating. I mean, do you think there's any real evidence that these prophecies in the Quran are really playing out today? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think uh, you mentioned about this interview. I do not think you can do justice to the rise of Zionism, which happened before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. 1897 was well before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in Sykes Pico in 1916-17. So I think the whole rise of Zionism and then the First World War and the Second World War, I mean, this whole phenomenon, what the hell is Zionism? Yeah? I mean, that's another program. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, it can only be looked in the context of eschatology, in which the state of Israel and the forces and ideology behind it position its center stage in world history. There's a coming climax. It's happening already. Those who are blind uh, can't see it. You need to look at developments in that region um, from a different perspective to understand what is happening and what is going to happen. But We're talking hang on, about because... Israel being at the center of a new world order. We're talking about a new world uh, order government centered potentially in Jerusalem. Well, look, uh, the the uh, Quran is saying all sorts of things, and it's difficult for Christians to know really what uh, the, or people from the Christian, more Christian countries. Um, but don't you think that there's some kind of uh, correlation between what Christianity is saying and what Islam's saying? Because uh, also worth pointing out that most Zionists in the world are Christian Zionists; they're not Jewish Zionists. Well, that's a very good point, according to one Islamic es expert, in particular, Sheikh uh, Imran Hussein, based in Trinidad. Uh, if you Google him, Sheikh Imran Hussein, many videos. He also talks about this issue in eschatology, that in end times, uh, how do we come to terms with this strange alliance? Uh, to, to understand this, 
uh, uh, obviously the state of Israel, uh, it is not centre stage yet. You know, power isn't in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. It's in places like, you know, Washington, London, uh, Rome, dare I say. Uh, but uh, like the collapse of the British Empire, Pax Americana will also collapse. And maybe what's going to happen under Trump uh, will have to be, uh, maybe he's a Manchurian uh, uh, candidate, we'll see. But whatever Trump really is, um, the bottom line is Pax Americana will drain. And then the question arises, who will take over? And who do you think will? Well, that's what I'm trying to say. To understand the Zionist state of Israel, have we all, as intellectuals, and do we really understand what, what the state represents? Is it, for instance, a homeland for Jews? Or is it being manipulated by the pyramid satanic system to be center stage of the world for satanic forces and a coming clash between good and evil? Well, it's certainly, in, to, it's certainly in the right place to do that, isn't it? Uh, being uh, sort of right next to the plains of Armageddon or wherever it is. Anyway, yes. look, uh, how can people follow your, your work, Moheen? Be, uh, Moheen because um, I think that there, is a, there are a lot of people who are interested in all this, um, particularly the minutiae of Islam, because uh, there seems to be a lot of fakery around and it's quite nice to sort of pick that apart. So how do we follow your mm-hmm. work? Well, a very good question. We've had a website up <clears throat> for 10 years. Uh, uh, it's getting hacked, I might as well tell you. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to redo it and also maybe have a video focus. The last event, uh, <clears throat> the Eschatology uh, in the 21st Century Conference, Interfaith and Comparative Perspectives, is being uh, constructed into a DVD. So we hope to put that onto the Internet, including one of your websites, you know? Okay, and um, uh, and so whereabouts? What's your that. what's your think tank, and where can we find you if you've got a blog or anything? If people are interested well, well, in finding is, you online, well, 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 this was on the think tank, but as I said, there, there has been some hacking. It's globalvision two thousand dot com. Okay, we what about a, this what imam? A, Maybe you can give us his name again, and, and we'll put a link into his uh, his some of his videos. Think, uh, yes. Well, Global Vision works on a collaborative basis. Certainly, I'll give you his name. If you Google him, you'll get hundreds of videos. His name is Sheikh, S-H-E-I-K-H, Imran, I-M-R-A-N, Hussein, H-H-O-S-E-I-N. You'll see dozens of videos. Some of them are on one of your websites, too. Uh, so he, he's... Uh, by the way, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but uh, uh, a lot of what he says needs to be, you know, looked at uh, critically uh, and with an open mind. OK, Moeen Yassine, thanks very much for joining us on Dialect. Yeah, and thank you for having me. You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk, your local community radio run by volunteers. Log on to our website at dialectradio.co.uk to find out more. Yeah.